Hello everyone, welcome to Friday afternoon here at the Northeast Georgia History Center. It is May 22nd and we are here today with Ask a Historian. I'm Glenn Kyle, I'm the director here at the Northeast Georgia History Center and I want to answer your questions about history. Now I have some questions that have been sent to us since then, so I'm going to go ahead and dive right into those. I'm going to take them from the easiest to answer to the maybe take a little more time to answer. So that's why I have my phone here. I promise I'm not surfing Facebook and ignoring y'all. So. First question is, is it true that Germany called the tanks giant tractors? Well, I'm not sure if Germany called them that, but tanks really were developed and invented in World War I. It was, it was really the British who came up with the concept, and the idea behind a tank was something that could cross very difficult terrain because wheeled vehicles got stuck in the, in the no man's land, something that could move through barbed wire because you have to remember that trenches were de uh, defended by lots and lots of barbed wire that could extend for like 10 or 12 or 20 yards deep of barbed wire. And it's incredibly hard for men to move through that or to cross trenches. So the British developed these, at the time, very top secret weapons and they used them, uh, they, they used, uh, they based them on agricultural equipment because they're used to moving in, in heavily plowed ground and, and so agricultural tractors. And to keep secret what they were developing, they simply called them tanks as in carry water to the battlefront tanks. Uh, that's how the name stuck. Now the Germans were a little bit slower to develop tanks in World War I. They only really came up with one version, the A7V, and it was a big, slow-moving, usually broke down behemoth, and they didn't make very many of them. As a matter of fact, there's only one that still exists in the world, and it is in the World War I Museum, the Army Museum in Australia. I'm sorry. Australia or New Zealand, somewhere down in there. But the name they came up with for tanks was Panzerkampfwagen. So what that means is uh, Panzer means armored and Kampf means fighting or war and Wagen, of course, means wagon or, or wheel transport. So they, in classic German fashion, they're using their language to very precisely describe what they're talking about. So it is an armored war vehicle, Panzerkampfwagen. So uh, they just shortened it to Panzer, uh, which is armored. So that's, that's really the origin of tanks and how they get their name. Um, you know, uh, who discovered America is another question. That's sort of a broad issue. And it determines, you know, as historians love to say, well, define your terms. What do you mean by discovered and what do you mean by America? Let's assume that for the sake of argument, we're assuming that America means the New World, right? What we now call North, Central, and South America. Perhaps a little bit of, um, you know, the, the other north, upper reaches, maybe even Greenland. Really, you could say that the first ones to come here and discover it were the folks who came across probably a land bridge across the Bering Straits, what's now the Bering Straits. So the Native Americans, that we, as we call them, the, the Native Americans, as Canadians call them, the First Nations, came here tens and thousands of years ago and developed civilizations very much separated from European and Asian cultures and civilizations. So they were the first to discover America, the landmass, and that isolation kept them isolated again for thousands and thousands of years. And then, um, you know, some of the other people to come were what we call Vikings. The, the Scandinavians came and they came to, to the very, very north, north of America. And they did eventually have a settlement there at Lansall Meadows, but they found Vikings, the Vikings found the native tribes a little too violent for their taste, and they actually abandoned the colony not, not very long after that. And, and we have written records of this, and they referred to the Native Americans, the Vikings did, as scralings because of the noise that they made when they attacked. I love that word, scralings. So a little after, and so the, the Vikings take the knowledge of the New World back, but they don't really do anything with it. They don't come back. And we think of Columbus as the discoverer of the Americas. And what we really mean by that is someone who came from Europe, came to the New World, and then went back with the knowledge, encouraged further uh, exploration and voyages to the New World, and began a back and forth exchange, right? That's really what makes Columbus different going all the way back. You know, other Vikings had been here. We think a couple of Irish folks had gotten here. Some of the Chinese 
may have actually landed on the west coast of, of the Americas. Uh, there's some records to indicate that. But they don't really mean anything until Columbus and the, the Spanish initially start to create an exchange back and forth and make it a regular trip. And then that begins what we call the Columbian Exchange, which is biological, uh, which is cultural. That's how diseases get here. That's how a lot of new foods get to the old world. A really interesting thing. So, so when and who discovered America depends greatly upon your point of view, right? Um, another question. Oh, this is an easy one. My favorite history-related TV shows. Now, back in my younger days, and by younger I mean late teenager and early adult, I would read history, of course. It may be hard to imagine, but I did, and I, and I just consumed it voraciously. And I be became quite critical of anything on television or the movies that wasn't as accurate as I thought it should be. Well, that's not accurate. This is terrible. That's not how things really happen. And, and in my, my old age, let's say, I've mellowed out, and I tend to just enjoy the story as much as I can. And as long as there's not egregious uh, inaccuracies in both the story and in the material culture presented, I do tend to enjoy it more, and I'm not as critical. So my, my recent uh, favorite television shows about history, uh, I've been watching Outlander, which is very interesting. It, it takes you through a lot of interesting history, uh, especially when they're in the court of, of Louis XV. Uh, Turn was a four-season show about spies in the American Revolution. Again, not exactly accurate to the historic record, but a, but a good presentation of the times. Um, you know, it's it's and, and some of the television shows, it, it's hard to find um, long-running things. It's it's easier to point to movies. I can tell you that some of my favorite history movies are uh, Kingdom of Heaven. Again, not terribly historically accurate, but a good story. And if you want historically accurate, there's a couple from the Napoleonic era. One is Waterloo, which was made in 1970, and it's not been released on DVD, unfortunately, and it was supposed to be the big blockbuster because it was about Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo, and, and two-thirds of the movie is just the battle, which sounds boring, but it's really, really well done. It's in the days before CGI, so everything you see is practical effects and real guys, and they brought in 15,000 extras to film this movie, and I think it's available on YouTube it's in, in its entirety. Another great Napoleonic movie is Master and Commander, which, for my money, may be the most historically accurate movie of all time. Not necessarily in the story it tells or the adherence to the record. It's a work of fiction. But the material culture, the way they sail the ship, the way the men interact, the clothing, the weapons, the way everything happens in that movie is just remarkably historically accurate. So. There's some TV shows and movies for you. And one other question, and then we'll see if anyone's got some questions uh, in the feed, is who fought in the French and Indian War? And I, I told Libba beforehand, well, there goes our hour. Sorry, we're not going to be able to take any questions. Uh, French and Indian War is an absolutely fascinating topic, not so much because it's a, a, a tale of military history, which it is, but it's really the genesis of what made America as we tend to think of it today. We are here, we're, uh, you know, English is the predominant language. Uh, English culture, even if it's evolved into American, is still the predominant culture. And that all comes from the victories sustained by Great Britain during the French and Indian War period. And you have to remember, so the Spanish were the first of the New World, quickly followed by the French, and, and followed a little bit by, uh, by some folks from the, from the Netherlands and some Portuguese and things like that. And the British were actually kind of latecomers to the New World. The Spanish had been here for about 150 years before the British ever really began to, to settle. And, and the British settlement goes very slowly. But these European powers, remember this is the beginnings of the Age of Empire, so these European powers are struggling to try to control this vast, uncharted, untamed wilderness to their control to basically make themselves more powerful and make themselves more rich. And the French and Indian War is basically the culminating event in Europeans' efforts to control the New World, and especially North America. And it's that war which sets up the, uh, the Englishness of what becomes North America. They finally, the, by the end of the French and Indian War, the English have kicked out the French, they kicked out the Spanish, more or less, from North America. 
And the English continue in their spread in terms of population, in terms of westward expansion, in terms of their relations with Native Americans, in terms of world trade. And, and even though they, they have a setback shortly after the French and Indian War, because that sort of leads into the American Revolution and they lose those North American colonies, French and Indian War, War is what sets up the worldwide British Empire and makes Great Britain the greatest empire on earth and, and arguably in history. And so the French and Indian War is, is a really core event. It's tied to the Seven Years' War in Europe, but it's a really core uh, event in, in our nation's history, in our continent's history, and in world history because it's, it's sort of that point where things are one way before and then things are a different way after. So it's a fascinating topic. What kind of questions we got today, Libba? All right, uh, Mandy would love to know more about Hernando de Soto. Ah, Hernando de Soto, more about him. So I'm, I'm glad you asked. That's something that we do cover here at the History Center. We've got some school programs we do. I think we've even got some webisodes. Uh, okay, yeah, Libba's going to put uh, links to the webisodes in the chat. So de Soto was a Spaniard. He had been with Pizarro on his expedition to conquer the Inca. And, of course, the Spanish... Uh, expeditions that come to Central and South America go there for very specific reasons, to conquer and to extract extreme wealth in the form of silver and gold, right? That's why they're there. And the men who take part in these expeditions against the Incas, uh, you know, against the, uh, uh, the Aztecs become incredibly wealthy men. And so De Soto is with Pizarro when he conquers the Incas, and he wants to lead an expedition, not just to conquer, but his intention is to set up colonies in this incredibly totally unexplored area, which is today Florida, mostly the southeast of the United States, Florida, the Carolinas, Georgia, and Alabama, and Mississippi. And so he gathers this very extensive, very multinational expeditionary force, lands in Florida, and sort of works its way up. And... Um, like I said, it's very strong and it's very powerful. And, and he goes in not just to conquer and extract wealth, but the sources we've seen indicate that he's bringing people along with him to, to establish a colony, right? To establish a town, a village that will become a city that will become a capital of a Spanish province. And of course, that makes him the governor of all of this. Uh, fame, fortune, and glory, right? And so he begins the expedition, and they're going deep into the interior of this vast wilderness, this, this untamed, to them, untamed area. Of course, the Native Americans live there, and that's, that's really part of the problem. So DeSoto goes through, and he continues to, and I'm, I'm summing up in a nutshell here, he continues to exacerbate relations with Native Americans until he gets to what is now probably Alabama and takes uh, and against the, the people... Uh, around Mobila, which we think has become Mobile. But at the Battle of Mobila, he loses almost all of his supplies. He loses a huge part of his forces. And now, instead of a colonizing expedition, it becomes something that is merely an effort to survive. And so they're trying to get to the Mississippi River so they can float down the Mississippi and link up with a relief force and get back home alive. And uh, when they get to the Mississippi, DeSoto himself dies probably of dysentery, of a, of a, of a digestive tract disease, and dies, and, and they actually dump his body in the Mississippi River. They're able to make some very, very makeshift craft float down the Mississippi, and not very many people make it out. They did not get rich, and so DeSoto's expedition was, was in effect a failure for its intended purposes. Now, what is the grand effect of the DeSoto expedition? fantastically huge because what it does is, like I said, imagine going into Florida, a line that goes from Florida up into the Carolinas, sort of across Georgia, Alabama, into Mississippi, down the Mississippi River. That's a lot of contact with a lot of Native Americans. And what he does and this expedition does is bring disease, bring European disease to those areas. So even though the Indians were actually able to fight off this expedition and, and militarily totally defeat them, Within 10 or 15 years, almost every major civilization in the southeast, and they were major civilizations, had crumbled and collapsed because of death due to disease. Sometimes we think the mortality rate may have been as high as 90%. I want you to imagine a world where 90% of the people have died. That's going to cause a, 
a destruction of any civilization, and that's exactly what happened to these Native Americans. So, so that uh, that really is the legacy of the DeSoto expedition. All right. Our next question is: Is it true that on his deathbed, James Madison's <coughs> doctor offered to give him medicines so that he could hang on longer and die on July Fourth, like Jefferson, Adams, and Monroe did? Oh, that. Okay. So that that's a question that I don't know the answer to. The question is: Is it true that Madison? Um, was at he that he asked for medicine on his deathbed? I'm not uh, sure. no, yeah. yeah, so that so that he could live until July fourth, seventeen, uh, or, or die on July fourth, the same way that Jefferson and Adams did. So let me let me explain Jefferson and Adams. So this is you're about to go look at Wikipedia because you're going to think I'm making this up, but it is absolutely true. So the Declaration of Independence. Is declare, declares our independence to the world on July 4th, 1776. And two major players in that, of course, are John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And their friendship in the course of their political career is really the story of early America. And they're, they're both living and they both die on the 20, I'm sorry, not the 20, the, the uh, 50th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence July 4th. Both of them on the same day on July 4th on the anniversary. You can't make this up. And so apparently the question is, did Madison also try to, to get into that club? So his doctor offered, but he declined the stimulants and ended up dying on June 28th. Okay, so yeah, so his doctor offered the, the medicine. There were stimulants to try to keep him going so that he could do that. But Madison, probably wisely, declined those, and he ended up dying on, on you said, June 28th? June 28th. So yes, so the, so the doctor offered, but but Madison declined. So so good for him. Who knows what his quality of life would have been for those last few days, just trying to to make it to a weird uh, accomplishment, maybe. Don't know. All right. So our next question is. Um, so uh, one of our viewers has an ancestor whose grave is on who, who fought on the Union side of the Civil War. But their grave is not in the Civil War veterans section. Um, is is she thought it was strange since there was plenty of room in the veterans section? Wondering if she might have been disgraced somehow. Thoughts. Thank you. Right. Um, so so someone's ancestor had fought in the Civil War and um, and did they die in the Civil War or I, just? I don't know. Yeah. They so but but and and the question is they're not listed as being buried or they're not buried in the veteran section. And, it, and why would that be? Is it, could it be a, a matter of disgrace or something like that? I doubt that. I doubt that. Uh, the way they dealt with death in the Civil War and the way they, they handled the bodies, of course, after a battle, they're going to gather all the, all the dead together and they're going to put them in cemeteries and, uh, because they have to do something with the bodies for religious reasons and for practical reasons. Um, so they bury them all together. But what happens is, especially after the war, uh, families may come and try to, and they, their loved one, they may want to take that body home to be buried in their hometown. Uh, they may send an agent to have the body shipped back home so that it can be buried in the town. So the fact that your uh, Civil War ancestor is not buried in a national battlefield or, or at the battle where they died or something like that doesn't remotely mean they were disgraced. It may mean that the family arranged to have the body after the war sent back home, or, or they went to get it themselves, or even shortly after the battle, they went down there to get the body themselves, because that was a very, very common thing that happened. So the fact that they're not in that particular section. Now, I don't know if you know where that, uh, where the, where the ancestor is buried now or not. Even, even if you can't find out where they're at, that doesn't mean that, that they were disgraced or that they, uh, it just means that the body may have been moved. The body may have been missing in action. Don't know. All right. Our next question is um, about World War One. Why did the French wear blue uniforms and a blue helmet? Ah, so the question is in World War One, why did the French wear blue uniforms and blue helmets? Why not? No. <laughs> so that's uh, um, I think the reason you're asking that is you're is you're saying to yourself that's not a very camouflagey way to go about things, right? So. You have to remember that the idea of camouflaging yourself in warfare is a relative, especially everyone, is a very comparatively recent experience. Uh, people did not worry about that in 
you know, in, in the 1600s and the 1700s and the Crusades and the ancient world, they weren't interested about blending in with, with their surroundings. Um, as a matter of fact, during World War, uh, you know, and, and it's only in the late 18, excuse me, the late 1900s, no, I'm sorry, in the late 1800s, armies sort of began to develop uniforms that maybe sort of blended in, like, like khaki for the British, right? That, that light tan color for colonial troops, if they were in the desert or something like that, they would wear those. But those traditional uniform types died very hard. And the French uh, chose Horizon Blue because they actually did think it was still soldierly but would blend in. You have to remember, that's not how they started the war. How did they start the war? With red pants, right? Les pantalons rouges, c'est France, as the saying went. Red pants are France. That was, that was their thought process because that's what soldiers wore. It was very dashing and daring. So when the war started, they're wearing dark, dark blue coats with red trousers. And they did begin to realize that not only does it look horrible in the mud and everything and you can't keep them up, but you need something that's at least going to blend in to, to the terrain you're in. So they do adopt that horizon blue. It's horizon blue because they... Uh, if they go over the top, then perhaps that's going to be camouflage against the sky, right? The Germans developed gray uniforms um, that, that, that are more drab. The British and the Americans go in with drab brown uniforms. So they all did adopt that. So, so even though it seems weird to us to have that horizon blue, it, it was actually a, a pretty good color, especially for, for hazy days or if there's a lot of smoke from artillery bombardments or something. Now, you mentioned the, the helmet. Um, now, to remember, the French were the first nation to widely adopt protective headgear in World War I, right? Everyone went into the war with, with soft caps, or the Germans did go in with their leather helmets, which were not meant for protection, but were meant to, as all uniforms were at that time, to look cool, to look good, to look soldierly. So that when the French developed this helmet, they immediately began to realize, wow, our um, casualty rates... And our, our wounds are going down distinctly in headwinds because, remember, they're in trenches. Stuff's falling down from above. And so it's basically not to protect you from bullets or things, but it's to be a hard hat in a, in a hazardous area. And all the countries quickly followed suit. Of course, Great Britain looked to medieval armor, actually, to, to kind of see which helmet was going to work best for them. And when you look at that Tommy helmet, it looks very, very much... Like a, like a kind of helmet from the medieval period, right? It's, it's much wider, and it comes out this way because it's also protecting from the top. And the Germans have a different helmet, and the Germans, of course, being German, uh, probably did the best job with the helmet. It gave good overall coverage. It gave around-the-head coverage from when they were up and moving in their trenches, and they took the time to heat-treat those helmets so they could be a little bit harder and a little bit more protective. Uh, the French helmets were not heat treated. They were of much thinner metal, but they, they still protected more than, than just a soft cap. All right. Our next question is about comic books in the 1920s. Uh, do you know anything about the early days of I, comic books? I don't know a lot about the early days of, of comic books, especially in the 1920s. I know that a lot of them came out of efforts to kind of serialize and put into one spot newspaper comics and things like that. I know Buck Rogers... And, and comics like that became very, very popular. And that's probably the ones I'm most familiar with um, is, is those, those effort to do comics. Of course, it's a great way also to get kids to read. I mean, it's very visually heavy, but it's also... Uh, and they would adapt a lot of classic stories into comic books. You know, by classics, I mean, you know, like... like Jules yeah, Jules Verne and, and things like that. Uh, lots of adventure stories, and they were mostly, uh, as far as I understand, focused to boys. They were, they were focused at, at, for boy stories. They were marketed to young boys, not so much for girls, because a young lady, of course, is not supposed to read comic books, right? She's supposed to be doing young lady things. Um, so that's, so that's, that's about as much as I know about, about the early comics. Oh, Bass Reed. I, I know a little bit about him, sort of in the in the in the cowboy days, right? I think so. so yeah, I think I think he was um, was he a U.S. Marshal? Yes. Yeah, so he was a U.S. Marshal, an African American. Um, I believe he was a, a freed slave. 
he had, I think he had been a slave, he was freed, and he took up this um, responsibility of law enforcement. And this is in the Wild West, right? And people are needing to find ways to protect them. And, and this is something that's unfortunate. I talked a little bit yesterday about six shooters and pistols and things like that. One of the unfortunate presentations that we have of the Old West with a lot of the Old Westerns is that it was, it was very monochrome, right? There are lots, it's mostly white people and the Indians are usually the bad guys. Well, the actual West in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s was very, very different. It was very multiracial. And they were needing to pull folks in from all over the place. And, and, and Bass Reeves was, he was a pretty good law enforcement officer. I mean, he's in territories that are unorganized and he's going out to get bad guys. And if I remember correctly, he did not die in the line of duty. He died um, like of, of natural causes. And a, and a law enforcement officer in the Old West who dies of natural causes later on must be pretty good at what he does and, and a very imposing presence. And, and uh, you know, that, that was one of the, the great things is um, the West being somewhat less organized gave a lot more opportunity to people who might not have had other opportunities. There is no way Reeves could have been a, law, a lawman out East in, in Philadelphia or, or in any of those cities. There's no way. But when he comes out West, they're looking for someone who can get the job done and he steps up and proves that um, being a good law enforcement officer, being good at what you do, being a figure of authority is not based on your race. It is based on personal character, personal integrity, and personal ability. All right. Our next question is, um, since many of us are homeschooling, who do you think are the most important historic figures that could be taught to elementary school? Oh, that's a tough question. What, what do I think are the most important historic figures to be taught to elementary school students. Oh. Or maybe uh, you yeah. Um, I mean, it depends on how far back you want me to, to go. Um, you know, I think uh, going, stretching way, way back, I think looking, if you're talking about individuals, um, Julius Caesar is always great because that's, he's sort of the representation of ancient Rome that we think of, right? And, and there are, there's, here, here's one thing about Julius Caesar. If you're trying to look at things from a multidisciplinary point of view, you've got history because there's just the history of Julius Caesar. You've got politics because Caesar seeming to go from a republic to something that might be a dictatorship. Uh, lots of civic duties and, and election things in there. So you've got um, politics. You've got literature. Not only what you're probably thinking is, is the Shakespearean play Julius Caesar that's one of Shakespeare's great works that we always think of, right? Friends, Romans, countrymen, lend me your ears. I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. But also just the fact that Caesar wrote one of the great works of the ancient world, Commentaries on the Gallic Wars. And that's a great thing to read. You can, If you really want to go all the way, you can teach Latin by, by reading that. But there's plenty of translations that tell you about ancient history. And... You can look at it from an artistic perspective as to how Julius Caesar has been portrayed in drama, in film, in painting, um, all the way basically from the day that he died up to the present day. And, you know, Marlon Brando played, no, uh, yeah, he played, he played Caesar. I can't remember who played Mark Anthony in that, in that movie. So Caesar is one of those multidisciplinary people. Um, I think... And, and I'm guilty of this too. When you're looking at world history, it's very easy for us to tend to focus on Europeans. And, and, you know, like I said, I'm guilty of that too. But there's lots of ways that Europe interacts with lots of other countries in the world, uh, lots of other areas in the world, lots of regions, and regions that interact without any European involvement. So going and looking at some of those interesting uh, folks like Genghis Khan or Chinggis Khan, depending on how you want to pronounce it, um, Moving forward in history, and you start looking, let's say, at American history, I think integrating, and, and this becomes more familiar with folks, integrating the stories of the big names as well as the little names becomes very important because there's something that you may have studied called the great man theory of history, and a lot of our history has been based on this, where you look at the big important figures like, like Julius Caesar, uh, like presidents, like uh, leaders of business and things like that. Well, I think those are important to know, 
But I also think you have to look at the history of the people who lived at that time and just the, the general social history of people who lived at that time. I think, um, you know, some of the figures, if you're going to teach history, you want to find themes within certain periods of history that can tell you a lot about what the average person felt and thought and experienced in those times, and you're going to be able to pull in individuals as exemplars of some of those larger themes. That's, that's sort of a dodge on your question, but man, that's a tough one to answer on the seat of my pants. <laughs> Sophia wonders, how many states were there at the beginning of the War of 1812 and how many states at the end in 1815? Oh my goodness, how many states at the beginning of 1812 and how many states at the end? You're going to have to get me on. It's a, it's a commonly known fact that historians are not very good at numbers. I know we had 13, 14, 15, 16 at the beginning of 1812. Like as, of, as of April 30th, 1812, we had 18. Okay, so 18 states. So let's see, that's the original 13 colonies, right? Um, plus Kentucky, Tennessee, um, Louisiana, Ohio. That's right, Ohio was one of those early ones. And Vermont. Um, and oh, Rhode Island had been there. Oh, yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was one of the colonies. But, yeah. but here's the thing you have to remember about uh, the War of 1812 and how many states we get to the end. During the War of 1812, and this is some, some Southern history, um, the Creek War, I think we've talked about this in one of our programs, the Creek War that was fought by Georgians and Tennesseans, led by Floyd in Georgia and Jackson in Tennessee, defeated the Creek Indians and took a huge amount of land in the Treaty of Fort Jackson. And um, the states may not have come to be at that point, but you get basically the state of Alabama, you get the state of Mississippi out of that, you get a good chunk that returns to Georgia, and not very long after uh, the War of 1812, you get Florida back, back, depending on, <laughs> not back, when you get Florida from Spain back into uh, you know the U.S., you've gotten all those territories that you've just gotten with the Louisiana Purchase. And that speaks to the efforts of Americans to really turn their attention to the West and for, for westward expansion. Really, the War, of 18, not, the War of 1812 was about settling things east of the Mississippi River and securing America's relations in relation to other countries. And when they were able to tell Great, when they were able to prove to Great Britain and themselves, that Great Britain can no longer interfere in what they were trying to accomplish moving west, that made expansion happen really, really quickly. And a lot of the proponents of that were from those relatively new western states like Tennessee and Kentucky and Ohio. It starts to shift the political power in the country away from the eastern seaboard, which is where it, auto, it had always been, and starts to shift it west closer to the Mississippi River and closer to all that territory that the United States had gained in 1803. All right, next we have, uh, was the War of Independence a war against Britain or the king himself? Some Brits in the UK celebrated and a lot of those fighting on the American side were Brits against the king. Ah, so the question is, was the War of Independence a war against uh, Britain, Great Britain, or was it simply a war against the king? And, and, and how is that viewed? Because I think the question had come from how Great Britain uh, in the UK, now today's UK, teaches the war. Um, I think it depends upon which uh, patriot you would ask. At the very, again, at the very beginning of the revolutionary movement, most people did not immediately jump to independence. They saw themselves as British subjects, loyal British subjects who had rights under the British Constitution. That was sort of the whole point they had helped so much in the French and Indian War, right? They were very proud to have been a contributing factor in Britain's victory in that war, and they wanted to continue that civic pride and that civic duty. And so when, when things started to, to not go so great between the mother country and the New World, people simply wanted to assert their rights as Britons, and they began uh, and this was both ideological and political, you can't blame the king because if you blame the king, it is treason. But the colonists were saying, well, parliament is unfair. The king's ministers are unfair. The king's ministers are bungling things. That's why we're pushing back and pushing back. And so that was their way to try and make this about um, 
gaining their rights as British rather than independence. But something happens. Uh, King George's ministers convince him to create a document that declares everyone who's agitating in his American colonies as traitors to the crown who must be summarily executed. And it's the king, when he sends this proclamation, these are the words of the king, basically backing up everything that the colonists had felt was, was a wrong to them. At that point, the Americans realized there is no choice. The only way to redress these, if they're backed by the king, is to oppose the king. And the only way to make treason against the crown legitimate is to gain your independence from the crown. So at that point, Americans very quickly moved from agitating for their rights as Britons to pushing for an independence from Great Britain and an independence as not one nation, but 13 sovereign states, right? Remember, this is the United States, lowercase u, capital S at this point. And so, you know, how it's viewed in Great Britain, I've done some study on this and it's very interesting because Great Britain, uh, the citizenry, was not terribly interested in holding on to the colonies. And there were a lot of forces in the British Parliament who did feel that the Americans were being wrong. And at a certain point, they said, well, just let them go. Either give them what they want, which is fair, or let them go. That would be the right thing to do. And this war continues to drag on. In modern parlance, it would be what we call a quagmire, right? The British just keep pumping money and men into the new world with nothing to show for it. And eventually, what allows the Americans to, to get Great Britain to the negotiating table in 1783 in Paris is the fact that Great Britain is done. Uh, France has come in on the side of the Americans, which made it a global war, which made it cost a lot of money. And they realized that it simply wasn't, not only were they not going to be able to keep the colonies, it wasn't going to be worth it even if they could. It was going to be too expensive to bring people back in who were going to be very uncooperative anyway. So eventually Great Britain says, well, go your own way. And, and, and that was that. And, and that relationship, the way the British saw Americans was sort of as, sort of as ungrateful provincials, right? They, they don't know what they're talking about. They don't know how good they've got it. And they're really going to miss us when we're gone. And that attitude sort of leads into, into the War of 1812 as well. Another question about World War I helmets. Why did Italy have basically the same helmet as the French, the Adrian but green? Yeah, okay, so the question is, uh, again, World War I helmets. Why did the Italians adopt almost the exact same helmet as the French? Uh, they painted it a different color, but it was in effect the exact same design, the exact same manufacturing process. Because it had been tried and proven, right? And, and they already knew how to set up factories to make these helmets not by the hundreds or the thousands, but by the millions, right? France, is making, France requires millions of helmets to equip its men, and, and the same thing for Italy. So rather than trying to get their own scientists into something and try to figure something out, Italy just said, oh, your helmet works that well? We'll just, we'll just start making those. It's a great design. Poof. And so, so that's why um, they were able to you know, uh, just make it own. The French helmet was... Since it wasn't heat treated, was pretty simple and quick to make, and so it makes it more appealing for a country to, if they're trying to get helmets into the hands or literally onto the heads of their soldiers very quickly, you want something that can be made quickly and made cheaply and made efficiently. Okay, our next question: Can you talk about the rise of movie production in the twenties? Ah, so the, you know, talk a little bit about the rise of movie production in the twenties. Sure. So. You know, motion pictures is just a, 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 a continuation. Motion pictures are, are a continuation of a voracious appetite for entertainment that had been growing in the United States since the end of the Civil War. Um, amongst urban areas, you get lots of um, vaudeville and live theater and things like that. But this slowly burgeoning idea of motion pictures with the technologies available means that you can show the exact same thing in a lot of different places and never discount the fact that it's something amazing and new. It's new technology and it's a new form of entertainment and people hadn't seen it before. Um, one of the first popular movies, The Great Train Robbery, right? It's about, it's a, again, it's a Western. We love our Westerns. It's about someone, a group of cowboys 
going to rob a train. And at one scene, uh, to show how the bad guys are bad, the bad guy takes his pistol and fires it directly at the camera. This blows people's minds. They're ducking and dodging under their seats because this you, sounds corny, but think about it. They've never seen that before. What if you went to the newest three-dimensional hologram and you didn't know it was a hologram and someone takes out a gun and starts shooting at you? You're going to freak out. And so people really began to see the potential for how these movies could be shown and how these movies could tell stories. And so, you know, horror movies, uh, adaptations of, of um, parts from American history, adaptations of classic literature. Um, and this is in the silent era, right? They haven't figured out how to make sound work with motion pictures. So what's being shown on a screen has no sound whatsoever. And usually what happens is there is, a, is an organ player or a piano player in the theater who has sheet music and he's supposed to try to sort of go along watching the screen and playing the, the music to go along with what's on the screen. Um, and so there's a lot of comedy. You've got Buster Keaton, you've got uh, some of the early science fiction like Metropolis and, and a lot of these silent films are actually, I think they're on YouTube now. They're, they're interesting to watch and, and uh, it's, a, it's also some, a way people could get news and see scenes from around the country and around the world that there's no way they would ever see, right? And so by the 1920s, it had become an incredibly popular medium of popular entertainment. And then someone comes up with this amazing new technology. What if you can make the movie have its own sound? And the first talkie, as they called it, was the jazz singer, right? And Al Jolson and the jazz singer it's a musical, and so it's something you go see it on the screen, and he's singing and talking, and you can hear it. Again, blows people's minds. And at that point, silent movies more or less have to stop because who wants to watch a silent movie when he could watch a talkie? And so the talkies really pick up, and cinema continues and stays in black and white. There's a lot of different film styles that are developed. Horror right, is developed in this time period. Film noir is developed in this time period and moving on into the 30s until the very, very late 30s, you start to get color movies like Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind uh, and, you know, movies just keep on going. But that, that very early part of when people were really trying to experiment with how movies could work, how far they could stretch the technology, remember there's a, there's a lot of efforts to put in special effects too and these are the most practical of practical special effects uh, where they would have a like a shrinking thing. I, don't, I probably can't do it with this camera, but they would have things like this and they would have them. You see, you see how my hands kind of look, one looks big and one looks small. That's exactly the sort of thing they would do when they would film and then they would go, woo, and do these different kind of weird special effects. Um, so it was a really neat time. And if you can go back and watch some of those, it may seem dull compared to, you know, the Avengers or a Star Wars movie now, but it's really, really neat to see that genesis of how this very popular medium started. All right, our next question is, when did slavery start in the world? When did slavery start in the world? Uh, I cannot give you an exact time, but we know that it existed as far back as the very first civilizations and the records that we have. Um, slavery, in its most basic definition, is uh, one person or body of persons taking absolute control over the life of another person or bodies of persons. Um, and this is usually done as punishment. It's done as a way to increase labor supply, right? Uh, it's, it's done as a way to increase, and, and as, a, as a means of labor, it's meant to increase productivity. So all the way back, and this was something that you could do, right? If you, if you, were, if you were two city-states at war, and you fought and you fought and you were able to defeat them, well, you could capture some of them and, and rather than just saying, well, I'm going to let you go, you could enslave them. And in enslaving them, you would have a free source of labor, you would have a free source of, 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 of all sorts of things. And this was very, very common. And even in, in ancient Rome, ancient Rome was built on slaves, on enslaved people. But when we think of slavery in America, we always, and we have to, think of racialized slavery, linking the condition of enslavement to the color of one's skin or, or one's racial background. That's a very 
16, 17, 1800s thing to do. Before that, slavery was not tied to race. As a matter of fact, slavery was just considered a condition that could fall upon anyone, right? The ancient Romans and all the territories they conquered, of course, part of the punishment for being a conquered people was to enslave a percentage of the population. But the Romans did not consider the slaves subhuman. This is, this is, I'm not trying to justify slavery. I'm just trying to help you understand the differences. So in ancient Rome, a slave was a slave simply because of circumstance and condition. They considered many slaves to be not only smart and very talented, but perhaps smarter than them, right? Uh, aristocratic Roman families wanted to get a Greek slave because that Greek slave was the best teacher for their children that, because they knew more. They were better educated. Uh, they made better uh, actors in the theater and things like that. So moving all through history, it was a circumstance until you get to uh, pulling Africa into the slave trade. And because of a lot of complicated issues, slavery begins to be seen as a racial aspect, as a condition based upon one's skin tone rather than simply the circumstances of existence. Um, Slavery is obviously bad everywhere, but I, I, I think those two varying views of slavery for, for most of history and for America, you know, or American and early modern history, they're two very distinct definitions of slavery. And those definitions certainly changed over time, but slavery has been around forever. Uh, we touched on this before, but for this viewer um, who's just joining us, how did the world react to the Spanish flu? Was it a similar step down to now, or did it just run its course? Oh, yeah, so that's, so that's a good question. So, you know, we've talked about this, uh, but it's important to, to address it again. So the biggest pandemic that we can think of right now to compare to what we've been in for, for several weeks is the Spanish flu epidemic of 1919 and 1920 that happened immediately after World War I. And what are some, some, some similarities? What are some differences? Well, the similarities are, even with the more, uh, I should say, not as advanced as we, medical science at the time, they knew that large group together bodies of people could spread it faster. That by this point, they did have germ theory, and they knew that, that it was probably spread um, via the air, which means breathing in and out, as well as contact, but breathing in and out. So when you look at some of these photographs from... Uh, the Spanish flu epidemic, every, everyone is wearing masks. Uh, some people said, oh, it's not that serious. It's, it's relegated to Spain. Um, and certain cities in America decided to implement social distancing because they even then understood that having people not be in large gatherings or, or large areas of, um, you know, where they were going to be packed in closely could help uh, slow, not stop, but slow the spread of the disease and, and kind of get through it uh, without much death. So, so a lot of the ways we're, we've dealt with this pandemic now is, is the way they dealt with it then. Some of the differences are that um, Spanish flu is a, is a good bit deadlier. It spread, I, I believe, don't, don't quote me because I'm not a medical doctor, but I think the rate of infection is, a, is similar but the death rate that, that was experienced due to the Spanish flu was much, much higher. We're not exactly sure on the numbers. It could be as high as, you know, 50 million people around the world died of the Spanish flu in a period of about a year and a half. We're not even, fortunately, thank goodness, we're not even close to that point. And, and interestingly enough, with the Spanish flu, a lot of those deaths, the, uh, you know, the COVID-19 thing we're going through now, the most susceptible populations are the ones, the, the older populations, right? The retirees, the 65 and up, those are the ones that are in the most danger. And we think that's, well, that's because they're old and not healthy. Spanish flu hit 20-year-olds uh, much, much harder than it did older folks back in 19 and 20. We're not exactly sure why. We think it had something to do with the, with the way it attacked a, a healthy immune system as opposed to a com maybe compromised immune system. But, but a lot of the, the deaths were from young folks. And remember, that had to have been a horrible experience because this same generation had just gotten done fighting four years of the worst war in human history, right? And now, all around the world, the, the exact same generation is having to deal with and be hit by the Spanish flu. And we do know, not sure on the exact numbers, but can you imagine a flu, a disease that kills more people 
in a year and a half than the greatest war in human history did just a few years before that, or the year before that. Um, so the circumstances are similar, and there are lessons to be learned, but they're, they're, also, they're also different. Can you tell us about the Missouri Compromise? Yeah, so the, okay, so the Missouri Compromise. Um, this was something that happened, um, let's see, I believe it was 1850. Uh, again, you'd be surprised at how bad some historians are with dates. But the Missouri Compromise was an effort by uh, eight. Oh, that's I'm sorry. There, yeah, the Missouri Compromise was 1820. Then there's the Compromise of 1850. I'm I'm getting it all mixed up in my head. Since the creation of the Constitution, the northern states and the southern states realized that there was going to be an issue with the expansion of slavery into the new territories and going westward. And there were concerns about this not only for moral grounds, but for economic grounds, who was going to have the most successful uh, economy, agricultural or industry, or industry, industrial base, as well as political. Because as you expanded west, uh, territories were going to become states. Those states were going to have representation in Congress, both in the Senate and in the House of Representatives based on population. And as slave states and non-slave states began to run into each other with political and social and economic conflicts, power in government was going to determine how laws were going to be passed, what tariffs were going to be passed that were going to favor one of those visions of America or the other. And so an entire generation of politicians comes up, kind of the ones who had gotten us into the, the War of 1812. We're talking about Henry Clay, uh, John C. Calhoun or Calhoun, uh, Daniel Webster, and some of those guys, what they're trying to accomplish is to negotiate how things are going to move forward to keep the union together. Because even that early, they're realizing that a split over slavery could eventually lead to a split within the union. This is a great fear, right? They tried to split the union up at the Hartford Convention during the War of 1812, so it's always a danger. And so the compromise began to say, well, let's, let's say that uh, um, where, is, where is the demarcation going to be going north and south? Where is slavery going to stop? Where is slavery going to start? And you have to have the, uh, um, the this was about the, comp the Missouri Compromise is what we're talking about, right? I'm sorry. There's a, there's a lot of compromises in this time because they keep having to renegotiate to keep things to keep things calm. So the Missouri Compromise says, we're going to let Missouri in as a slave state. We're going to let Maine in as a free state. But we're also going to set a parallel across the North American, American continent, 36 degrees, uh, 30 minutes. And that imaginary line that runs across the middle of the continent, north of it, there will be no slavery allowed in the future. South of it, there will be sla slavery will be allowed in those territories that are about to come states. And the, the problem is that seemed like it was going to work. Okay, well, everyone agreed. We, so Missouri comes in as a slave state. It is above the 3630, by the way. Um, and so the Southerners get their slave state, representation in Congress, and expansion of that particular type of economy. Maine, which is way up in the Northeast, is self so like, well, go ahead and take it. We don't care. That's not anywhere close to us. And so we get a balance in the House of Representatives. And you get that line that theoretically is going to fix all future issues as to where slavery can expand into and where it cannot. And then this, and this is why I got confused about 1850. So a little later on, we fight a war with Mexico. Long story short, we conquer Mexico. Texas has come into the Union. We conquer a lot of territory from, uh, from Mexico which means that now instead of sort of just butted up there at the end of you know, Kansas and areas like that, we've got this huge territory going all the way to the Pacific Ocean that now we're going to have to decide what to do as to whether those are going to be slave or free. And it starts all over again. They decide maybe we shouldn't argue about the, you know, the 3630, should that one stick, should that one not, what are we going to do? So this a whole generation of people who are working out the 1820 compromise, the 1850 compromise, are holding things together. And that's what a compromise is. It means that neither side gets everything they want, 
but they're willing to come together and, and make some concessions so that the overall big picture of things can continue to progress. And when that generation exhausts itself and just gets old and in effect dies out, you start to get into the late 1850s and of course the election of 1860 when there is no more room for a compromise. The compromisers are gone. Everyone who's left is a hard liner. And without that ability to come together and, and, and create an understanding, the country is propelled almost uh, irrevocably into a civil war. How's that for a quick answer? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to finish up with three more questions. Okay. Um, we want to know, did Daniel Boone and George Washington ever meet? Ah, did Daniel Boone and George Washington ever meet? I don't know. I don't know if they did or not. Um, it seems like um, they might have. Daniel Boone is, you know, he's just a, a wild frontiersman at this point in, in early American history, and George Washington is that planter elite. Um, so I don't know if they ever met or not. I'm sure they probably heard of each other. Uh, Daniel Boone did lead forces during the American Revolution into what's now Kentucky, but, but, I, but I don't know if they ever met. Next question is, um, is it true that just before the end of the Civil War, Jefferson Davis fled Richmond, Virginia, um, dressed as a woman? Oh, oh, yeah, so is it true that, that at the very end of the Civil War, uh, Jefferson Davis fled Richmond dressed as a woman, uh, and he was captured in Georgia, actually? He did flee, right, because he is the figurehead of the traitorous and rebellious government of the Confederacy, and so the Union wants him more than they want anyone else. He's public enemy number one. And was he dressed as a woman to escape? No, that he was not. He was, now he was, uh, they were traveling by coach, and it was, a, it was a cold night, and from what I understand, he had wrapped himself in a cloak that was more or less a woman's cloak. But he was not in a dress, and he was not in bloomers, and with a you know, and things like that. Uh, it was a woman's cloak. He was not trying to hide as a woman. Um, and then, if you really want an interesting thing to read, go check out what happens after he's captured. How does the Union deal with this guy? Um, it's it's a, it's an interesting issue. The uh, the the um, uh, incarceration, let's say, of Jefferson Davis. Oh, the question is, in the very earliest civilizations, what came first, using plant fi fibers or pottery? Uh, by plant fibers, I'm, I'm sure you mean like weaving cotton and linen and, and, some of the, and taking the flax to make linen and some of those other things. Probably pottery. Uh, if you're talking very, very early, like Neanderthal, uh, they're going to use skins and furs for any clothing that they might need. Um, Weaving uh, cloth and, and the creation of cloth comes well after pottery. Pottery is, a, is something that can be done with natural materials by anyone. You know, the, the clay and, and, and things can be shaped. Um, the early stuff, you don't need a kiln. You could just let it set out in the sun and dry. That's not as durable. You could put it next to or in a fire, which would make it even more durable, perhaps a little bit more brittle, but, but more durable, a little harder. And so pottery does come first because it's, it's something you can cook in, it's something you can store food in. Uh, and these hunter-gatherer societies, of course, would gather more than they needed at that exact moment. That's sort of how civilization increases by having surplus, which leads to a higher birth rate, which leads to uh, an expanding labor pool, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It all gets complicated and, and boring with some of those big theories. But to answer your question directly, pottery does come first. And I think that was our, our last question. Um, folks, we have had such a good time doing these. This is unfortunately our last day of doing full to, uh, uh, five days a week for the live streams. And we hope that you've been able to get something out of it. I hope that we've been able to, to teach you a little bit of things about history. But I want you to know that having done this, y'all have taught us a lot too. You've taught us that there are lots of people out there that are as in love and as hungry for history as we are. The response has been overwhelming. Uh, you know, we sit around, Lib and I uh, and Marie will talk about how fantastic it is to get your emails, to get your support, uh, and, and, and going through the comments and seeing some of those regular names has really touched us personally. And it's meant a lot. 
Uh, thank you for inviting us into your homes on a daily basis. It's been a, a real honor and a real treat. We're not done. This is, this is not goodbye. This is just we won't be seeing you as much as, as we used to because it looks like things may be opening back up. The History Center is going to open its real doors again soon. Uh, school is out. Uh, distance learning, uh, as far as the public school go, goes, has come to an end. But, but we're still going to be around. We're going to have our digital memberships. If you want to keep having access to that content, we're going to have exclusive content. And we're going to keep doing that. We're going to have at least one broadcast a week for our digital members. Um, plus, all, as, we, as we open up and as our regular, regular programs continue, you're going to have access to those and, and to exclusive live streams as well. So please consider being a digital member so that we can keep in touch. That's really important to us, uh, knowing that y'all are out there. So thanks again for uh, having all this together, have, having, having uh, this special time. Thanks to the Contrails. Thanks to the Ivisters for all the donations they've given to the History Center to keep us going over time. And thanks to you, our viewers. Without y'all, it's just us sitting in here talking to ourselves. But because of y'all, I feel like we've gotten a family, and it's been amazing. Y'all stay, stay safe, take care, and we will see you again soon.